Hello everybody, my name is John Hammond. In this video, I am really excited to share with you guys. I had a conversation and a chat with some of the developers and organizers for the All Army Cyber Stakes or ACI CTF that went on a few weeks ago. And I, I think it had a lot of incredible and awesome insight that I wanted to share with you guys all about, okay, not only playing Capture the Flag, but hosting a Capture the Flag, putting on an event, maintaining everything and all of that goodness. So on the call with me, I have Tillery, one of the lead organizers over at Grimm who put on the All Army Cyber Stakes Capture the Flag competition, and Alex from Storm CTF who also helped out in creating the event and making some challenges. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, roll the call and conversation. So thank you guys, hope to see you at the end of the video, and take care. Well, cool, thank you for doing this. I appreciate you, got, you uh, being able to come in and hang out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm been looking forward to being able to chat with you about it. So I'm glad to be here. I mean, I feel like it's totally casual. We're just hanging out. It's it's. I'm not okay. trying to be anything formal. I, I hate using the word interview because <laughs> I don't feel like that's right. <laughs> but some good sure. questions on everything about cyber stakes. Uh, I'll probably, if you're cool with it, have this recorded uh, just kind of on my side. And I'll go ahead and edit it afterwards. Maybe add just a silly intro as to like who we are, what we're talking about, etc. Um, and if you're all comfortable with it, I can probably upload it tomorrow in place of what would have been the cyber stakes video for that day. So. Okay. Yeah, that works with me. Cool. Should we just roll in ahead? Should I just like badger you guys with questions? Are you all? <laughs> <laughs> no, that works for me. Yeah, all right. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, again, open to anyone, whoever is willing or wants to chime in. Um, can you give me a background on kind of what, the all army cyber stakes is like your point of view. How do you define it? So. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, obviously it's, it's name kind of describes it a little bit, but it's, it's the premier kind of largest, uh, most engaged DOD CTF training kind of event that really exists. There are, there are a lot of these types of things. Some of them are attack defense. Some of them are just kind of larger CTF kind of concepts, but none of them really hit the level that the AACS does. So um, I think of it as less of a CTF, although it very much is, and there's a leaderboard and more of an opportunity for training, um, which is why I'm so excited to work on it. This is this is our second year at Graham working on this and, and doing development, because ultimately this is less about being a competition and more about getting all of that information into people's heads and, and guiding them along uh, as we go. And obviously we work really hard to make it like fun and a competition, but um, I run a training team because I want to do training. And so that's, that's why I built this out the way I do. So. Awesome. That's awesome. How long did the competition go for? It was only, was it a week? Is that right? Uh, it runs for 10 days. Okay. Um, and the, the idea is that we want it to be able to go over at least two weekends. So it starts on a Friday, goes over one weekend, keeps going for the entire next week and then over the last two days um, to give everyone a chance to compete, whether they're uh, doing this as their primary you know, deployment or not. Uh, so a lot of people are in um, development or, or training in some some way, uh, whether those are folks coming over West Point or you know, elsewhere in the DOD or other, other branches. Um, and some of them can dedicate time just to doing this. But most of the people that are doing it are gonna be doing it in the afternoons and the evenings and the weekends in between their actual deployment. So we want to be able to make, give as much time as we can to people who can't just do this as their primary tasking. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I honestly got started on it on the weekend because I think it opened up on that Friday and on the weekend. And then like once Monday and the rest of the week kicked in, it's like, well, I got to get back to my day job. So I couldn't submit as right. much time as I wanted to. Is that normal for you guys? Is that always what you do? I mean, I know other there are obviously tons of capture the flag events and competitions out there. Yeah. Um, is that kind of normal for you to being able to have a competition that runs so long, or is that always the goal? This, I mean, this it's definitely anomalous. Uh, this is by far the longest competition I've ever been a part of. Um, I think it's really smart for for Army Cyber Institute to set it up that the way that they did, given their audience. Um, but most of the CTFs that that Grim does development for, that I do development for, that I help run. Uh, run for a weekend, three days maybe at, at the longest. Uh, some of them as short as four hours. So it's a huge struggle. Um, actually chatting with uh, Major Exdell and some of the other folks at, at Army Cyber Institute during the events, um, you can you can definitely tell by the end of it that it's a long event. And um, when you're giving you know live help to competitors, potentially eight, 10 hours a day, plus doing infrastructure work, it's tough. I don't, I don't know how they put as much time as they did into organizing it, doing all the infrastructure. 
me just trying to field questions from competitors for that amount of time during the live event was enough to kind of melt my brain a little bit. But um, <laughs> they, they also joked that by doing it for 10 days straight, their brain melts, melts enough for them to forget how much it is. So by next year, they're really excited to do it again for the full 10 days. Um, so it's definitely by far the longest. I know um, Alex and I have originally kind of connected um, through work that uh, he does running Storm CTF and their events aren't, aren't nearly as long, right? Uh, what, what kind of are you looking at there, Alex? So I know this year we're running one that's gonna be two days long and I'm mentally preparing myself for that one as it is. <laughs> yeah, so so then you have you know 10 days and especially with the, the turnout that we had this year, which was just ridiculous, it's tough, but uh, it's a lot of fun too. One of my, um, I could dovetail into, into a, a kind of a story, but like one of my favorite things that I did during this 10 day experience was um, I was working with one of the competitors who was completely new to one of the categories, binary exploitation, um, had done a lot of web work, had done some crypto work, but didn't really know reversing or binary exploitation at all. Um, and it turns out that this year, um, Army Cyber and, and the DOD decided to open up the competition, not just to folks in the DOD in the US, but also Ministry of Defense folks from the UK. So uh, I, I had been chatting with this person, trying to help them through the RE101, just the very basic reverse engineering challenge. And I got to the point where we were looking at uh, looking at the, the binary in opstump. And at this point, like, yes, I can type out, here's what this column means and here's what this does, but it was gonna be so much more work to type it out than to just have a conversation. So luckily we were doing all of our work through Slack to actually like interact with uh, competitors during the event. So I just threw up a quick Slack call and like over the course of the next 10 minutes, we got to explain like, here's how x86 assembly works. Here's how <laughs> pointers work. Like this is the obstump output and managed to get him started and he was able to go, go through and solve the rest of that challenge from, from having that. So. Uh, it's definitely definitely cool to see that, and and that wouldn't happen in, in a shorter competition as well or kind of frame. That's awesome. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, both of you, you all play capture the flag like you yourself, right, Alex Tillery? Yeah, I see you. Yeah. I see Grim all the time at conferences. I remember I'm still trying to get into some Howdy Neighbor over at DevCon, <laughs> um, yeah, and sure. Storm CTF over on Alex's side. You're we're cool to I guess Tillery mentioned. Hey, Storm CTF is one awesome thing that you do, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we also build um, some CTFs as well. Um, just, we're more of a dealing with the non not-for-profits and things like that. We deal with a lot of the local chapters and things, so. That's super cool. I'm, I'm just excited to just kind of have the conversation with both of you guys, both of you all. I mean, not only as a CTF player, right, but I like to try and build some things myself when I can. So what did each of you work on specifically for CyberStakes? What were you in charge of? What were you trying to produce? What were you helping on and making? Alex, oh, so you want to jump in first? Yeah, sure, sure. So I was actually a developer this year. Uh, nice. Previous year, I was actually a tester. I did a little bit of testing, but mainly I, I was in charge of creating a, a few web challenges. Um, I'm not really the binary exploitation and or reversing guy just yet. So uh, web's kind of my specialty when it comes to building. Um, and so I, I ended up building uh, two challenges this year and that was uh, blame it on the temp and the sequel always sucks, so. I know a lot of people struggle yeah, to blame it on the temp, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah those, those were two challenges that um, they, they really got a lot of depth of thinking from competitors. I fielded more challenge, more, more challenge questions probably from uh, from that SQL injection challenge than any other SQL challenge I've ever run. And, and that was because like we, the way we designed it was not a simple SQL injection you win. You actually had to take a couple of extra steps to get in there. So uh, those, were, those were both really good challenges. I'm really, really glad we had Alex to work on those because awesome. they definitely went beyond kind of the, that, that basics. Um, so I'll jump in now, I guess, and, and I'll answer this question. Uh, my, my role was kind of split between a bunch of different things. Um, at its core, I, I was the technical director for the project on the Grim side. So um, a, lot of, a lot of that was communicating with the technical folks all, over at Army Cyber Institute, um, working with you know, all the developers we had and, and the testers to make sure that everything was kind of going smoothly. Uh, the day-to-day -day operations, I, I had actually um, one, of, one of our really talented employees kind of handled, uh, uh, and uh, that was Straith, if you know her, um, was, was handling most of that day-to-day and -day in, in the uh, kind of operations there. The bigger picture and the overall design of all the challenges is kind of where I came in. So um, my job was, let's, let's take what we want to teach and what we kind of have as feedback from last year, since uh, Grim also did the development on uh, AACS3, and kind of build out what, what can we do that's going to be better this year. 
So rather than starting with a bunch of challenge concepts like we did last year, um, I kind of made a list of these are the learning objectives that we know we want to hit. And we want to make sure people learn these things and in these ways. And then we took those learning objectives. We took those and turned, the, you know, my, my job then was let's make those into something that is a solid concept for a bunch of challenges. And then I got to make pun based names for all of those. <laughs> so uh, I, I like to think my biggest contribution is that every single challenge had a, a pun for a name this year. So that, that was my big thing. Awesome. But um, yeah, the, the overall technical direction for the project was my goal. Awesome. Very cool. How many people were working on the team? Like how many did you have overall? Can I ask? Is that okay? How many hands or yeah, how did you divvy uh, up the work? Uh, yeah, let me let me take a look at the spreadsheet that we use to track our challenges nice. and do a quick count. That's Let's awesome. See. Looks like we had... I'm always just like a one man show with Team. a couple of friends. Yeah. <laughs> we had a total of uh, 14 developer, 15 developers um, across the challenges. So everyone took on at least at least two challenges. Um, we, we developed 50 this year uh, for, nice. for Cyber Snakes. So there were uh, 73, I think, challenges overall in the competition. 50 of those were developed by us. The others were developed as either the tutorial challenges or a little bit of introduction ramp into difficulty for each of the categories. And those were developed um, over by Army Cyber Institute to kind of fill out uh, what we did. And part of that is because um, last year when we did this, our challenges were just too hard. Uh, <laughs> some of them were just ridiculous to the point that we couldn't even deploy them. And then, oh you know, the, the things that we called 500 point challenges last year on the scale that we used this year probably would have been 750. Uh, and, and only a handful of them got solved. So we pulled that back a little bit, focused more on the learning objectives, like I said, and, and um, tried to have a smoother kind of learning ramp, which I think we did really well oh, yeah, with. This absolutely. Um, I think so too. And one of one of the kind of the, the joint decisions that Army Cyber Institute made was, you know, the, the really low hanging stuff that every CTF needs, but that is the same every time. Mm -hmm. We weren't going to be doing the development on that, right? They were going to take that on, kind of develop those, which is where you get kind of that, that 23 intro ramp up challenges. Um, and then we would start coming in at, at like, for example, in, in binary exploitation, we have a uh, we have a jump ESP smack stash, right? But it's not just like your basic jump ESP stack smash. There's a little bit more involved in there. That was um, uh, whereas was, the, was that your cup overfloweth? Is that right? Yes. Nice. That's it, yep. <laughs> so that was that was that was our version on our development side of RE101. And so anything earlier than that in difficulty <laughs> was developed by Army Cyber. And and again, that was because they, you know, we we had a conversation and made the conscious decision that if we're developing 50 challenges, we want to put you know, our expertise into the ones that are going to be more technical and more technically demanding. Um, and also try and hit those learning objectives in ways that are are new. I didn't want to make anything that was like an off the shelf boring challenge. So even the things that are, um, you know, this is a stack smash. It's a challenge you've seen a million times. Mm -hmm. How can we turn that on its head just enough to keep, you know, not just the people who are new learning, but also the people who aren't interested in, in progressing. Cool. Very cool. I definitely felt that like, even with some of the, so I, I, I like web personally, so I spent some time on that. But the stuff with um, even the, just the cross-site scripting one where, okay, this is normally a classic cookie catcher, but there's so much other evasions and stuff that I need to do to get past the filter. And it's stuff with the, uh, the XXE, the XML mm -hmm. entity one. There was just so many cool... It's like a classic vulnerability, but then it felt like there were a lot of other gimmicks or gotchas where you have to be really clever in like your attack and your payload. So, Yeah, and that was exactly the goal. You know, if, if you got... The concepts, if you actually understood the concepts, you'd be able to make that pivot. But if you were using off-the-shelf tools or, you know, we're, we're just kind of trying to, to throw brute force at it, you wouldn't necessarily get there. And that was kind of that was kind of the goal. Um, the later the challenge is as well, the more of that there is. So oh, you yeah. mentioned the XXE challenge. Um, that one was specifically designed so that you can't do this unless you actually understand what you're doing. <laughs> cool. So... When did you guys get started on the whole process? When did you start development? Like how much time did you feel like you really had to pour into all this, both of your developer side, lead side, et cetera? Um, so the brainstorming for challenges for this year started when last year ended. Cool. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as soon as AACS3 was over, we were thinking, okay, what do we want to do next year? How do we want to approach this? Um, you know, we, we had a closeout meeting with, uh, with, then captain, now Major Regsdale, um, mm. about like, here's what here's what was good, what was bad. How can we, you know, try to hit these goals a little bit better next year? So right after that, 
I started brainstorming, a bunch of folks on our team started brainstorming, how are we gonna do this next year? Um, as far as the actual development time goes, um, it was really accelerated. And th that was the case last year and this year. Um, our goal was to have the initial like list of challenges done within two weeks of our start date, and then have six weeks total for development. And that was it. So we developed all 50 challenges in a total of eight weeks, if you count some a little bit of development we did in the first kind of two week period. But the entire thing is developed really rapidly. Wow. So um, that puts a lot of pressure, especially on our testers. Uh, I, I know that mm -hmm. Alex had a lot of trouble last year and then, then this year actually made a, a full testing infrastructure. So Pico CTF in, in the way that it deployed is kind of set up two different ways. Um, there's the you deploy it locally and it's Docker containers and you just kind of do it. Mm -hmm. And then there's the full infrastructure, which is designed to be run on AWS with Terraform and Ansible scripts. Um, and last year, all of the testing was done in, in these kind of Docker container, you know, test environments. This year, Alex and some of the other testers, but especially, you know, um, the, the ones that were working directly with him, set up a full local install of that, right, Alex? Yeah, so I ended up just building out an entire, like, local platform, actually on this box right back here. Um, just completely built it out locally using Vagrant and Ansible, um, just like you were going to deploy to production so that any dependencies or anything like that would immediately be caught. Um, especially for the challenges that I was testing and that some of my guys were testing and the one, especially the ones that I was developing as well. I just didn't want to have that issue. Awesome. I'm trying yeah, to, yeah. oh, sorry, go right ahead. Okay. I was going to say, and, and that's especially important because uh, last year we actually found a few bugs in the Pico CTF platform Ooh. Um, such that if you're deploying it locally in the test environment, the permissions like don't get set correctly on files. So we had things that tested perfectly fine until you actually deployed it to a production server and then suddenly you can't get to the pieces you need. Um, and that's that's bad if, for example, your web challenge relies on you being able to pull a certain file down, or you have to know what version of, of uh, libc is running to be able to exploit you know, a, a binary exploitation challenge. And if you don't have permission set right in a Linux file system, it turns out that's really hard to do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. Um, so that, I mean, those things became a lot more obvious once we started testing in, in kind of a production setup. Um, rather than having to find them in the actual live event, which is what happened last year. So I'm, I'm hearing Docker, I'm hearing Vagrant, I'm hearing Ansible, I heard a little bit of Terraform, right? And I know Pico CTF was the framework and platform of choice. So like, I'm always just a poor man rolling with CTFD. Whenever I tried to tinker with Pico CTF, I am kind of finding like, oh man, this is kind of weird. It's not working the way I would expect. So what made you guys choose Pico CTF over any of the other frameworks, or what are some of the pros and cons of why you would want to go with that one versus another? Or was it just like, hey, this is what's normal to us. This is what we always use. Yeah, so uh, it was actually a really easy decision for us because ACI said, hey, this is what we're using. So we Good said, enough. great, we're going to use this. <laughs> um, there, my first experience with it was AACS3 last year. Okay. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't used Pico CTF before that, and I actually fell in love with it. There's a lot that it does really, really well. Um, and, and the biggest thing is that it's really good at scalability. Mm. So if I have a whole lot of people all hitting the same CTF, it's very good at spinning up, spinning down rapidly without all of those people having to share flags. That's the biggest thing I like about it is that it has this Ooh. instance concept. Yeah. So you can you can say when you, when you deploy a particular challenge, I want 10 instances of this challenge, and it replicates that 10 times, generating a new flag each time. Um, it also does a really good job of wrapping the typical types of challenges that you would see. So if you want uh, a binary exploitation challenge that normally acts on standard in, standard out, you could do that. And it wraps all of that in XINETD to make it an actual uh, over the network communication, but it still feeds it into standard in, standard out of the actual application. So you could do things that don't require network, but wrap it in network really easily because it handles all the XINETD deployment stuff. Um, so I like that a lot. It has classes for PHP and Flask for web challenges. Uh, so if I want to develop a web challenge purely in Flask, I can do that, and it will de deploy that cleanly. It'll scale that up or down as we want. Um, so a lot of the dynamic deployment options in it, I, I'm really fond of. Uh, what I don't like is the complete lack of documentation. Um, <laughs> there is there's really good documentation for the easy stuff. Right. If you want to create a new challenge, like a, a new crack me, and put that up, there's a walkthrough for how to do that. But as soon as you dive deeper than that, it's very clear that Pico CTF was made to run the Pico CTF CTF. Right. Right. Um, so the more complex things you can do with it, you kind of have to dive a little bit into the code to figure out. So uh, that's a bit of a problem. 
that's the case with literally every open source project I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. So I can't really fault Pico for that. It actually has better that documentation than a lot of things I've worked with. But uh, there are a lot of pieces that we kind of had to pull apart. And then the other issue that it has, which a lot of frameworks have that aren't just scoreboards, right? CTFD is a scoreboard, which you have to do all of the infrastructure yourself. Whereas Pico is not just the scoreboard, but it's actually also all of the infrastructure, including all of the deployment. Um, and most things that do deployment can't handle anything that isn't off the shelf 64 bit Windows, uh, sorry, uh, Linux, right? Everything is built on 64 bit Linux because that's what you're deploying in. And that becomes a problem for, uh, for me because my background prior to my current role was in Windows exploitation. I'm a Windows VR person. My nice. job is find vulnerabilities in Windows. So going to millions of CTFs and never seeing Windows challenges bothers me. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, we managed to find a way around that um, and, and some other kind of scalability problems that we ran into with particular types of challenges um, by creating a new problem type. So every, everything in Pico CTF is organized into problems. Um, and we created a new pl uh, problem type called Docker. And nice. that just, whenever you make a challenge in a Docker, it spins up a Docker container, for instance, and handles it that way. So we're able to do weird architectures and operating systems that aren't Linux uh, by doing that. So um, we use that pretty extensively in ACS3 because we had um, a bunch of, I don't want to say non-standard, but maybe more esoteric uh, hardware selections. We had a MIPS challenge. We had a PowerPC challenge, all of that last year. Um, we elected not to do that this year because we wanted to focus more on learning objectives and things people are going to see more day to day. But it also allowed us to do, uh, do you see what I see, which was one of my favorite challenges this year, which nice. is actually running, it's actually running a full command line only Windows install for each deployed instance. Um, it's running that inside of QMU, and then QMU is sitting inside of Docker, and then Docker is being deployed by Pico CTF. Holy cow. Uh, which is part of why that challenge was as slow as it was. Um, we also, we were able to get that down to only actually requiring 256 megs of RAM, which is not something Windows wants to do, <laughs> but you, you can do it. Um, nice. So uh, the, big thing, the big game that it had for me, I guess, the, my short answer is I like frameworks that handle deployment for you. I hate doing deployment. Um, I'm not a sysadmin, I'm terrible at that sort of thing. So if I can make my framework do it for me, great. All I have to do is hack up you know, some Python code and I have a challenge. Um, but that's me as a developer and hacker. If you look at someone who has more of an architecture background or, or deployment background, they want more power and more control and the ability to do things like create entire domains. Mm. So they're going to have more hands on there. And, and actually, Alex and I were talking about this just earlier today about this exact question. So I dive into some of your concerns with the platform if you want, Alex. Yeah, yeah. So that, that kind of goes back into um, the, the infrastructure and having the the sysadmin background, because that's where I come from. I come from being a Windows sysadmin and systems engineer. Um, and some of the challenges that we're trying to uh, look into building in the future, uh, specifically myself, um, for be it grim or my own personal reasons, are domain-based challenges, challenges such as resource-based constrained delegation, um, which only exists in an Active Directory environment, or passing the hash attacks with domain-joined computers exploiting vulnerabilities in group policy, things like that, those don't exist. And, and unfortunately, some frameworks, uh, such as Pico CTF, and it's not to rip on that platform, but they just don't support that specific type of problem just yet. Um, I'm sure that there's easy ways to, to implement that with some plugins, kind of like the Docker type and things to that nature. But um, other platforms, other CTF environments that don't have the deployment built in help me a little bit better um, in, in those kind of aspects. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think ultimately it's right. What is our goal and does the platform we're using support that goal? And in a lot of cases, Pico CTF will, and in a lot of cases it won't. Did you stick with kind of the flat setup that Pico CTF and vanilla gives you like AWS and Terraform deployment? Is that right? Yeah, so, so overall it's, it's based pretty heavily on, on what Pico uses. Um, all of the infrastructure was set up by ACI and they did a great job of, of managing that and, and keeping it all running. So uh, as close as I had to do as far as touching that was to have a, an account. Um, we, we added my SSH key to the, to the deploy user so that if something came up, I could fix it. But um, for the most part, yeah, they, they were able to spin that up. The things that are built into it are actually really good and the, the documentation for it is, is pretty usable uh, from what I found. Although Alex, you dove into that quite a bit more 
<laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I did run into a few issues um, with some of the the way that we were finagling some of the challenges. Um, I don't specifically remember anything in particular. Tillery, did you have one that you remember that we ran in specifically during development? Uh, so I, I will say that we tried to do a lot of things that the platform doesn't really mean for itself to do. Uh, right. So, so we, we did have to kind of pack around uh, around it for, for quite a few things. Um, the shared resource based challenges are kind of the biggest ones. So blame it on the temp was tough because yeah. when you have, you know, we, when you have as many competitors as we did, or or even as we planned for, which was significantly fewer than we had, mm. um, you you end up with you know ten or more people on one instance. If you have 10 or more people on one instance and you have resource constraints or you have to write to the file system in a particular way, then you, you can definitely end up with things where it interferes with other users. And that's hard to test for. Um, you know, every, every challenge we developed has an automated solve script. So when we're doing that, we can try and throw that script around and see if anything breaks. But if it relies on the correct process going the correct way every time, we might not notice edge cases and corner cases. So that's that's definitely something that, that we ran into some in the manual testing. And then we also saw during the event, blame it on the temp in particular, um, at least a couple of people accidentally found the path to solve the challenge because of something someone else had done rather than right. their own work. Yeah. Um, and that's not a bad thing necessarily, especially for people on the learner side, but it's definitely also not the intention. I think I remember yeah. seeing it even even while I was going through Blame It on the Temp is like I can see some other leftover files or some entries that they're leaving in that in that Jinja template, et cetera. Uh, but yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, just kind of like you said, the nature of the beast. So you mentioned. Yeah, and I don't think that it actually. Sorry, sorry. I, was, I don't think that it actually detracted from anyone solving that challenge or, or getting the most out of it. Um, if anything, it kind of gave them just the prod that they needed to find their yeah. way down, which we're not too upset about overall. Um, I, I try to limit the amount that I give out to competitors beyond what hints were given for, for a couple of reasons. One is fairness. Um, and the other is that, you know, a, a small prod and then you figuring it out means you learn more than if I just walk you through the solution. So um, so ultimately, those little artifacts being left around, I, I don't think that they're too much of an issue, but definitely not the intention. So you mentioned yeah. those uh, Docker type challenges. Sorry, to Alex, I didn't mean to stomp on you. No worries. Um, I was just going to add to that, though, is yeah, even, even the we did actually put in, I specifically remember um, putting in kind of some deletion, like automation that would delete those files every 60 seconds. And you can't always, you know, rely on that because if you're, if you're competing in, in the CTF and all of a sudden, um, you know, your files deleted every five seconds, you know, it doesn't really help you too much. So yeah, it does come back down into how many instances of this can you spawn up, so. Yeah, and, and mitigation can only go so far. Um, for for the uh, SQL challenge, for example, we we wanted it to be solved using an automated tool. We knew that, uh, and we wanted it to be a step further than just running a tool. So we we put um, we actually implemented that one in PHP, and there are some just really basic checks for your user agent. I saw and if you're using a default agent, user right? agent, yeah, yeah, it just drops you. Um, so you have to figure out how to change your user agent, understand a little bit, and and you know we wanted to mitigate in part people just running those tools and walking away. Um, even though part of, the part of the point of the challenge was, yes, you need to use an automated tool, we couldn't provide the resources for that, to, to have that available to everybody all the time. Mm. Um, but also, we couldn't mitigate so much that people can't solve the challenge, and we can't mitigate so much that you know, we can infinitely spin this up. So it's, it's a hard balance to catch, especially for things like that. Um, so there were, there were two major challenges now that the CTF is in learner, learning mode that we couldn't deploy. And one of them is that one, just because we burned through more processing time on that challenge than everything else combined. Oh my gosh. Um, and the other is the one that sends out emails. And we actually got ourselves blacklisted from a couple of uh, email systems <laughs> because we were sending out so many emails to people trying to solve that challenge. That's hilarious. I know you had mentioned the the Docker instances and how you, or that Docker type that you added for the Pico framework, is that the one that will let you kind of start and stop a specific port that you can access kind of per, per player? Is that right? Yep, that's that's right. Yeah, it, it kind of gives you an activate button that, that spins up a new uh, Docker container. You can communicate with that just for you. And then when you're done, it gets torn down. Um, or if you don't interact with it for a while. So our, our goal was we want something that works for challenges that have to be completely self-contained for one user. Mm -hmm. We want something that works for odd architectures because that was a big goal that we had last year. Um, and then we want something that allows us to do 
uh, things that running on top of just core Linux doesn't. So um, a lot of that requires containerization or emulation of some kind. And the easiest way to do that was just wrap it all in Docker. Um, all, of, all of that work was done by one of our really smart engineers um, that is also, so Grimm has an IT department that is roughly three people. And uh, our, our IT department is also on other work everywhere else. So one of the folks that's in, uh, in our AppSec team that worked really heavily on this project last year, um, Ben Lipton, also developed this, uh, this new class for Pico because I basically kept complaining we couldn't do things and he wanted me to stop complaining. <laughs> so he developed this, this Docker uh, type so that we could create these challenges that we had ideas for. Um, and it's gotten improvements and iterations over the last year and it was better this year than it was last year, more stable, more capability. So our, our plan now is uh, now that it's it's safely in the hands of, of Army Cyber as its maintainers, they're gonna push it back up to uh, upstream Pico and it'll be available for, for anyone that uses the platform. That's awesome, that's awesome. Alex, I know you had kind of been working with that, or I thought, right? Were you kind of on keyboard trying to wrestle with some of those? But I didn't see them on the SQL Always Sucks or Blame It on the Temp because those had the shared resources. Was that a different mentality or? Well, yeah, so I was I was a tester for a lot of the challenges that required Docker. So okay. I didn't actually develop any of the challenges that were built into Docker, but I did, um, I did have to interact with that Docker platform quite a lot, actually. Hmm. Uh, probably a good five or six different challenges, whether I was testing them or um, someone else was testing them off of my device. So yeah, it was it was definitely, um, and I will say it's definitely night and day improvements from last year on that platform. Um, it was much easier to spin up after talking with one of the one of the Grim guys on you know the actual process, getting the documentation down. It was a lot easier to do. And I think Pico CTF is really going to improve off of that very quickly. Can I ask about your, uh, like specifically your challenges, the kind of mentality and mindset and kind of what you wanted for the SQL always sucks and blame it on the temp. What were you kind of going for? Or does it, does it have the solutions that you wanted it to? Would it have multiple solutions? Can you tell me a bit about those? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'll start with the SQL always sucks. Um, so that challenge, like, like Tillery was saying, it definitely was supposed to be more of an entry level SQL injection challenge, but we definitely just didn't want to run SQL map done, you know, right. definitely. Not. So the goal for this one was to implement some checks into the actual, into the actual sanitization, but not use things like HTML special characters in PHP and things like that. You definitely, want to remove some of the restrictions while making it accessible for a SQL injection um, that's not just straightforward. So simple things were put into place. Um, like I said, the, the user agent filter, um, there were a couple uh, string replaces that were added, things like that, just to make sure that you weren't uh, just, you know, dropping, you know, the command in and winning immediately. So. Uh, that that was the main mentality there. Um, there was a specific um, there was a specific expectation or expected path for solving it. Um, and Tillery, I'm not sure if we can describe if we can disclose that. Is that cool? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Now, now that the competition's been around, that's fine. Okay, I just want to make sure. So the the initial um, actual solution was supposed to be more of a time based uh, injection. There were filters to kind of remove union-based uh, mm -hmm. injection, so that was kind of the the thing there. Um, and one of the one of the other mitigations was swapping out uh, quotes uh, and and double quotes for they were swapping each other. So one double quote would go to two double or to two, excuse me. One double quote would go to a single quote, and one single quote would go to a double quote as well. So things like that, just to kind of shake up the automated. Uh, injection track attempts. So that was that was SQL always sucks. And, and as as simple as it sounds, as simple as I'm explaining it, it was actually a little bit uh, tricky to kind of figure those nuances out with how SQL Map, you know, does its smart, you know, enumeration of, of databases and things. So, but yeah, so I'm sure there were multiple different ways to solve that, uh, <laughs> but that was the intention. Yeah, and so just, just as a little bit of insight into um, kind of how that process goes, when we generated our challenge list 
Um, by, by the time that it got to Alex's hands as here, develop this thing, uh, we had the general outline of here's, here's the delivery requirements, right? The documentation that we need back from you, solve script, that sort of thing. And then a technical description of the challenge, which for this one was, this challenge consists of a web app vulnerable to a SQL injection attack. The vulnerability will require slightly more sophistication than the easiest injections, but it will still be approachable. <laughs> and that was it. That's what Alex took and, and generated the challenge from. So uh, we, we definitely wanted to put creativity into the hands of the developers as much as we could, um, you know, when we were coming up with this initial list. And, and all of the developers really, really ran with it that way. Um, and we all worked, you know, when all of us were, were developing challenges, we all worked together. We had a, a Slack space that we were all working in. So we kind of bounced ideas off of each other as well. But the, uh, the technical descriptions that I wrote for these challenges were, were short on purpose. Awesome. Yeah. Let the let the developers just kind of run with it. I thought it was really cool yeah. to see SQLite for one thing because yeah, I guess I don't see that all the time, especially when it's supposed to have that bigger scale. But I guess hey, that's mm -hmm. part of the problem with that challenge being so resource in extensive. Um, but the timing attack was really really cool. I tried to avoid SQL Map because it, it just kind of gave me so much trouble connecting back and forth. But that was Good. really really cool. <laughs> yeah, one of the um, one of the things that a lot of people um, overlook is that SQLite actually does have a way to do multi, uh, multi-session writing. Really? You just have to, yeah, you just have to set it up a, a certain way. Um, but I, I don't know if it's undocumented, but it is a pain to initially uh, do if you're not looking for it. So you can definitely do that. Um, <clears throat> but I can, I, yeah, I can talk about uh, Blame It On The Temp too. Um, so this one was actually hey, very interesting because I'm kind of a Flask fanboy. I really do like Flask. Um, I, I like the flexibility of being able to go, oh, this didn't quite format quite properly well. It's Python, so I can just make it do that. Nice. And I really like that you can do that, mix Python with a web application. It's great. Um, but what was very interesting is that I had never really, I, I know what a SSTI is, but I'd never actually built a challenge that implemented server-side template injection before. And so when I was assigned this project or this, this challenge, it was one of those, okay, um, let me research this a little bit and figure out exactly what's gonna be needed for this. Obviously we're going with Flask because I have no idea how to write anything in Node. So, <laughs> so it, it was quite a, a no-brainer to, to write it in Python. Um, the challenge, I, the way you actually solved it in your, your video that you did was actually shorter than the proposed solution. Really? I, yeah, I actually spent, um, if I go back and, and I look, I think the solution that was written was probably... 211 characters, I think, um, just for the payload itself, the actual callback. But I did a full, I think I did a full reverse shell and everything as well. So um, yeah, I think you called one of the base classes a little sooner than I did. That's what it looks like based off the video that you did. So, and it's great because I was learning how to jump through these in, in Jinja and it was, it was a lot of fun to be honest. And then just throwing in that C surf check there, uh, oh, yeah. I think threw people off a little bit as well. Um, having to learn how to automate doing a C surf uh, bypass, I think that was kind of cool as well. Yeah, I have a, I guess, kind of in my set, and and some, if anyone's watching, you might have known from the Versec con another like a CTF that I'd put on recently. I had, um, and I think it, it might even be in Pico. 2019. The, the mask challenge that I have is a simple flat SSTI or server side template injection, but it's just getting the config object. So you can read the secret key and the secret key is the flag. Oh, nice. Okay. Nice and easy. Um, but I love that flask also for one thing as a development tool, like rapid creation of, of websites, micro framework is awesome. But I mean, in the CTF world, it offers so much stuff between, okay, remote code execution through that yeah. uh, and even like forging cookies or some of the other stuff you could do. Like once you get the secret key, you can do a lot of damage and do some interesting things. So super cool. Awesome challenge. So. Yep. Yeah, I definitely liked, uh, it, it could have been a single step drop and you're done. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the um, the jumping through hoops aspect of it to, to kind of, you have to do this and then do this and the, and um, 
So again, it was it's the idea of let's take something that people should be learning or understanding anyway and turn it on its head so it's still interesting to people who have done this a million times. Cool. So, Did you guys uh, run into so, any issues kind of before the event got started? I know you said, hey, between last year and AACS3, it just miles ahead of the production value, but were there any any hiccups or stumbling blocks kind of getting before up to the event and even during? Or is it smooth? Uh, but, Development was definitely, uh, I mean, there's always going to be stumbling blocks in development, especially when we're trying to do challenges that are a little bit outside of the norm. So probably half the challenges had some kind of stumbling block in the process of developing it. Uh, but but overall, um, especially comparing last year to this year, it was, it was super, super smooth this year. Um, I'm really happy with everything that turned out, both during the process of development and during deployment and during the event itself. Um, the single biggest headache that we hit was for do you see what i see really and, nice. and that was because we were we were trying to i knew i wanted a binary exploitation challenge in c and we'd written uh we'd written some last year but they didn't get deployed they ended up not being used because the overhead to do it was really high uh the plan originally was we have this windows server we're going to set that up but only for these challenges and pico doesn't support that out of the box so we'd have to add additional stuff to it to make this one server work and so we just didn't deploy them last year and I didn't want that to happen again this year. So we had to come up with a way to incorporate Windows as a binary, a, an actual runnable thing inside of the Pico environment. And getting Windows to run inside of QMU, inside of Docker on Linux is not easy to begin with. Right. Um, getting it to run small enough that its resource requirements aren't huge and we can actually deploy several of them, also difficult. Um, so when you put all of that together, it, it's really, really hard. We also knew we wanted to deploy this thing from a single static image if we could, because having to duplicate the entire Windows hard drive a bunch of times um, is a huge resource requirement on the disk side. So we, we actually implemented it to use a bind mount so that it could just use the one bind mount for all of the deployments. It spin up really fast. Um, in the end, when we actually deployed it in the competition, we decided to take that back out. And that did increase the requirements. It made it so that every instance that we launched of DUC what I see took a minimum of 10 gigs of space on, on disk. Wow. Uh, just to launch the entire Windows system, which is why we had been going for a bind mount, but that has its own restrictions and it limits other things that you can do. So by taking that out, we were able to deploy it more easily, faster, more of them, but it took a lot more disk space. Um, so we actually had to completely re-implement that challenge twice in the process of, of uh, developing it to get through all of the headaches and, and hoops that we had to jump through to make it work. So that was probably the biggest take up. Cool. My, my roommate, um, Caleb, and he's much, much more of a, of a binary ninja and like reverse engineering and exploit kind of oriented than I am. So I remember he, he wrestled with that challenge and I was, was I think it, that was the set comp filters, right? And the kind of the buffers, one that was working in one direction, the other was reverse. Am I thinking of a different one? That's, yeah, you're thinking of a different Uno. challenge. This Uno. one. Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> this one was a, a mostly straightforward stack smash, um, although a lot of people ended up building ROP out of it. Okay. Uh, which is an interesting kind of an interesting takeaway for me. We we built the binary such that it had uh, ASLR enabled and DEP enabled, mm. um, but we then disabled them on the system so that you actually could just jump straight to the stack I, and execute I it. I saw that in, in a write up. It looked like okay, the binary had DEP on, but the actual server right. had it off. Right, and mean. and so that's that's really a lesson learned for me. <laughs> um, like it, 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 there are lots of ways to figure out that it's off on the, on the system. Okay. And we, we intended for that to be kind of obvious, but it turns out it wasn't nearly as obvious as, as we wanted it to be. Mm. And that was a problem because we, we have this thing that, that like we, we designed to be a fairly straightforward, you know, binary exploitation challenge now turning into blind wrap. And that's hard, you know, yeah. it becomes a really hard challenge um, completely unintentionally. But that's also, it's also my favorite challenge for two reasons. One, because I'm a Windows person, but two, it's actually based on a real vulnerability that I found in my first year as a vulnerability researcher on Windows. Um, I had a piece of software that was a single threaded application. So it used select in a loop. And if you went down one path, it would read. And it had a read bug that lets you read more of the stack than you needed. And if you go down another path, you can write. And it had a write bug that lets you write too much of the stack. Um, we decided to modify that a little bit so it wasn't just a stack smash. We actually had offsets in an array that we used for this challenge. Um, but I took this real world vulnerability that I found back in 2010, back when I first started doing you know VR on Windows and turned it into this kind of fun, cool, slightly different CTF challenge. That's awesome. Very cool. 
Very cool. What, what did you guys use for in-game support for the players? I know you mentioned the Slack channel, and I saw that. Uh, was that like, hey, the best means, the only method, like get in contact with organizers or facilitators? How did that work for you? Why Slack other than Discord? Or I know people use like cheesy email, and that, that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. So there, there were email addresses that you could send, send things to, uh, okay. particularly if you had like account lockouts, that sort of thing. Mm. But the, the primary method was in Slack. And there are a few reasons for that. Uh, for one thing, Slack always feels slightly more professional than Discord does. Fair. Um, yeah, fair enough. But we also use the Slack and the fact that we, have, we can do shared workspaces to do a lot of work during the event. Um, we had you know, developers and, and management and stuff in the Slack prior to the event. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it was really easy to just kind of open that up to everyone since we already had all the users there. Um, the other thing is that the private channel support in Slack is better than Discord, in my opinion. So yeah. you know, we had we had a bunch of private channels that only certain people were in without having to manage a whole bunch of server roles and make it really obvious who's what, um, and that kind of made it cleaner as well. But um, that was definitely that was the primary method of, of contacting really anyone for support, and especially the developers during the event. I guess that's totally true. Kind of looking back and thinking, I mean, I know you have the different groups between, okay, the DOD side, some of the DHS guys and different branches in between. That's totally much easier to keep private rooms in Slack than it is in Discord. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. The, the only way you can really do it in Discord is to create group-based restrictions and then assign those groups to people. And everyone, there's no way to hide what groups are members of in right. Discord. Right. So. Very cool. Yeah, I, I tend to use Discord, but it's always like, an all well an all out brawl when things get to it. I mentioned Yeah, well and, and sorry. I was gonna say Grim Grim has a public Discord that we use for you know communicating and, and interacting with the <coughs> excuse me. That we use for interacting with the community at large. Um, and we don't use Slack for that because if you want a whole bunch of people in there, Discord's a great tool. Oh yeah. If you want a select group of people that have specific kind of roles and responsibilities, maybe Slack is gonna be a better tool. So cool. Very cool. I know you mentioned last year, once you were finished with AACS3, you immediately got started planning for the following year's cyber stakes. Are you guys already planning next year's cyber stakes? What does it look like? Can I can I ask? Can I peek behind the curtain? What are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, we're definitely thinking about ideas, and some of that's going to be taking uh, the lessons learned we have from this one. Um, for example, I'm definitely not going to do something that requires you to send an email to every user next year. <laughs> that was a big problem. Um, but uh, as, as far as the challenges go, I'm, I'm trying to find, think of new ways to do some of these same concepts, but in a new way, right? Because every every year is going to have a, sna a stack smash, right? Mm -hmm. Every year is going to have a SQL injection. Right. <clears throat> How can we keep that interesting across years? So that's kind of what I'm, I'm starting to think about now. Um, I also want to start incorporating more of the kind of important esoteric things that you, you don't see as much of. Um, so we saw that with uh, like overtime paid, like no one really thinks about OTP anymore. Oh, yeah. But it's still a really basic foundation of cryptography, right? So like what, what elements can we take and, and, we, and reuse and, and kind of do that? Um, at the same time, you know, last year and this year, we had very different focuses for our miscellaneous category because there's, you know, we always have the same categories and one of them is, is our catch-all bucket for things that don't fit into the others. So last year we had a set of challenges that were all um, having to do with radio waves and radio communication. And you had to take a look at those and figure out what was sent or look at the, uh, the waveform pattern and the flag is printed in the waveform pattern, things like that. Nice. So we did that for AACS3, that was our theme. And for four, we wanted to try and put more of a kind of defensive mindset on it so we wanted more things that fit into forensics, more things that fit into kind of defense and, and hiding of information. So I think I want to lean into that a little bit more next year. Uh, start trying to think about how can I take a Jeopardy style CTF, but make that interesting to blue team players. And I'm just starting to spin on that a little bit, but that's I think that's what I'm going to really try and do for our miscellaneous category the next year. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember seeing the audit log challenge and I know you mentioned overtime overtime paid. I was beating myself up on overtime paid because like, oh, this is clearly a one-time pad, obviously between the challenge hint, title and everything. I could see it in the source code, but then it's like, why can't I figure this out? And it's like, well, the very first line <laughs> is exactly what you need, having that known yep. value. I was like, wow, cool. Yep. I spent way yeah, too much time we, on we that. We made sure that there, yeah, we, we wanted to make sure that there were a few, a few cases of that. So there's actually three lines that are the same for every file. Oh. <laughs> the intro, a line full of spaces, and then the outro. 
And you can pick any of those three lines and that'll get you the key. Nice. So. And then again, that kind of goes back to our, our idea that we don't just want a challenge that you can throw a script at and win, right? We want something where you have to actually understand what is the learning objective here? What is the thing we're actually looking at? Because if you don't know how one time pad works, or don't know how XOR works, you're not gonna solve that challenge, right? But if you do, if you actually understand what's happening in the challenge, then you'll start to see that path forward and be able to solve it. Um, and we, we definitely found in some cases that once we started doing play testing, some of those were difficult because the path forward wasn't necessarily obvious without a lot of knowledge about it. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, we had to add to the hints because you know we, we want something that, yes, you need to understand it to solve, but we want something that you need to learn it and understand it to solve, not something you have to have been doing this for five years to solve. Uh, cool. With the exception, I guess, of some of the, the higher point challenges where it's okay to, to require some experience. But the lower the point value, the more, um, the more hints we gave for one thing and the more uh, kind of obtainable we wanted to make it. Well, I think having kind of, as you said, the idea and the whole concept that it shouldn't just be a throw a tool at it and immediately get a flag. It's kind of being able to understand and know the concepts behind some of the source code that you provide and stuff like that. So I think that is definitely a signature of a, of a good and high quality CTF. So kudos to you guys. Thank um, you. What uh, I think kind of to, to wrap it up, which would be a cool thing for hopefully some others that might be listening in or watching, um, what do you think is your best advice or what would you tell someone who wants to do this sort of thing themselves? Like, hey, they want to host their own competition. They want to put on a capture the flag. What should they know? What, what tools do they need to know? What technology should they be smart on? Uh, what is your words of wisdom to someone that wants to do this too? Um, yeah, so I, I have a few things, and I'm going to split it up into sections. Cool. Um, I love one that of them answer. is, yeah, one, one of them is, you have to host a CTF. You have to host a CTF. Right. So knowing how hosting works is really, really important, and a lot of that comes down to infrastructure. If you're not great at infrastructure development yourself, you need a framework that handles it for you, like Pico. If you don't want to be limited by the things that your framework let you do, then you have to understand how to do that hosting and how to do all of that kind of management and spin up. And to do that, you have to have a really good understanding of the scope that you're targeting. We were not targeting 2,047 solvers for this, this competition. That's what we had. We had 2,047 people with at least one point, and that is huge. Um, if we hadn't had something so scalable, that wouldn't have worked. So knowing what your target audience looks like is really important, but also being prepared for something a little bit beyond that. Um, we were really excited when we started seeing the numbers coming in. And I think a large part of that is that you know, this was a thing you could do remotely in a time when not a lot of things can't be. Oh yeah. But um, you know, preparing for that kind of unexpected is really important as well. And then the other half of it is to host a CTF, you have to host a CTF, right? You have to have a concept of what you want to be doing. So knowing what kinds of challenges you want or what your objective in doing this is, is really important. For us, this is a training platform first and a competition second. That's not to say that making it a competition wasn't important, and I think we did a good job of that, but at its core, CyberStakes is about learning something. And it's about everyone that's competing, even the high-level people, learning at least a thing. That's not gonna be the goal of every CTF. Sometimes CTFs are to test your skills, to see how good you already are. I've seen companies use CTFs as uh, recruiting mechanisms, and if that's your goal, great. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but you need to know that's your goal and really lean into it. So know the types of challenges you want, know the difficulties you want. Are you giving hints? Do you use something like CTFD that charges for hints? And if so, how do you set that up, right? And um, so kind of knowing that's really important. So, so my kind of two key takeaways are understand your platform or what, or, or what your platform requirements and have that ready to go and understand what your actual goal is for the CTF and build around that. A CTF that tries to do too much on either side of that isn't gonna be successful. Cool. That's some good insight. Sweet. Alex, I know you do this all the time. Do you got anything to, to toss in? Yeah, no, just one of the major things that I've learned um, in doing this, not just from a hosting side, but from an actual development side is you have to have a mechanism to keep yourself on pace and on track with development. Um, for example, some of the, the CTFs that I've built in the past, um, we started eight months before the event's even supposed to start and we get done a week before the CTF just because of personal problems, personal issues, work, you know, this, you know, might not be your primary job, 
these things definitely get in the way. So having that buffer time, um, planning for the unknown, and uh, and definitely using a, a tool. Um, I, I like two different ones, whether it be Jira or Asana, to just kind of keep yourself in pace with you know what you need to accomplish, and then having you know a project manager if possible just kind of tell you to you know, hey, this is due. I know that you have the other things going, but this is due. You should probably get on that. So. Yeah, those those are really good points. I'm I'm blessed that I get to do this for a living. Um, you know, it, building building this event was the thing I was doing while we were building this event. And when I'm building other CTFs, that's the thing I'm doing. When I'm building a new training program, that's the thing I'm doing. So I'm, I'm definitely really lucky that I got to turn this passion into, into the thing that I actually do for a living. And it's really exciting. But a lot of people are doing this as a hobby or as a side job or whatever. And it's it's definitely a good point that you need something to keep you on track. We so we set ourselves up in sprints. So we had uh, uh, an initial planning sprint and then we had our development sprints. Then we had an integration sprint and then the actual event was a sprint. And all of that was accomplished in a total of 10 weeks, not 10 calendar weeks because we, we ended up moving the CTF uh, because of a couple of reasons. But um, it definitely, if we hadn't kept on top of that, and if, if uh, Strafe hadn't done such a great job of, of keeping our developers and our testers in line and, and on task and meeting our deadlines, there's no way we could have delivered it, so. Cool, those are really good insights. I, I, I'm trying to like take it to my own heart because if I, if I want to do some other, something like this too, even just, hey, host a game on my own between some of the other events that are going, there's so much remote conferences and virtual events right now. I know a lot of people are asking, hey, can you put on a game? Can you put on a capture the flag? So those are that's cool. Those are really good words of wisdom. Thanks. Sweet. All right. I don't have a whole lot of other questions. I know we're wrapping up and getting really close to an hour point. So unless there is anything else either of you would like to add in, any other? If not, also totally cool. Thank you so much <laughs> for being willing, to, being willing to do this, have this conversation. Appreciate absolutely, it. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I don't really have anything else to add. I just really um, enjoyed the opportunity to talk about kind of some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, you know, it, it, seeing a capture the flag, a lot of people sometimes, and I'm not saying everyone, but sometimes people take them for granted um, that they're just available. They're oh, just yeah. challenges that are readily available, um, and they're not. You know, it takes a lot of work because people write them up. You know, uh, I know there are tons of write ups for ACI already. Um, for some of these challenges, those are burned. You can you can't use them again in a in a CTF that's going to be, um, you know, for prizes and things like that. So these takes a lot of time. So if anyone you know, if anyone is building a CTF, know that your work is definitely worth something because I mean, it takes a lot of effort to put on that stuff. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Just just to echo that, I mean, when we plan internally on my team. We expect developing a single challenge to take between 40 and 80 hours of development time. Wow. And you know, when, when you're developing 50, 70 challenges for a CTF that you're running once, that's that's a lot of time, mm -hmm. you know, and and I love doing it. So it's great that I get to spend that much time on it. But it's not, I mean, it's definitely a labor of love and it's definitely a labor to get these things out. Um, you know, and, and sometimes we don't have write-ups. And that makes it a little bit easier because we've reused some challenges. A lot of the challenges that are in, you mentioned Howdy Neighbor, are, you know, have been there since we first made Howdy Neighbor. Some of them we cycle out because A, you know, maybe somebody did a write-up for it, or maybe this challenge has just been around too long and has been solved so many times. And uh, that's that's a huge consideration too. So um, I think I think it also, you know, Alex kind of alluded to a lot of things that are the difference between a really good quality CTF that you want to play in and that you get a lot out of and a CTF that is just thrown together really quickly. And you see a lot of complaints, especially like I was reading a bunch of threads on Twitter just today about how CTFs are terrible because they always are solvable by the same tools or whatever. And, and that comes down to how you develop your CTF, what your goals of your CTF were. And if your goal, if the goal of your CTF is a bunch of challenges people learn from and you don't care about automated tools, great. If your goal is make it really hard for competitors, you have to test against those things. We have some, uh, we have a list of automated tools, automated solvers that people use on actual CTFs that we run against our challenges. So we, you know, every crypto challenge that we write, if it's an AES challenge, we run AES crackers on them and say, does will an off-the-shelf tool solve this? Um, and that's a yeah. big, you know, a big amount of time for that. You should probably add Katana to that now because that thing <laughs> is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
Yep. So oh, it's no. it's definitely did, did my tool get used over. for testing? <laughs> <laughs> that was uh I, I threw it together in a Docker container like probably a week ago and threw it against some of the older challenges that I've built and it was like, yeah, no problem. What else do you have? And it was really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But uh, you know that advancing the edge of the art is really important too, uh, both in competitor tools and in CTFs. And that's something that I really enjoy doing. And part of why Cybersticks is my favorite. I mean, I, I developed eight CTFs last year. This is my favorite. So um, just the, the amount that we're able to do here and, and the goals of it really align with, with where I want to be. Um, let's see, what other parting thoughts do I have? I, I did have one more. Um, yeah. If you are developing a CTF and you're going to be hosting it and all that good stuff, um, if there's an option to have a larger server, go with that option. Um, especially <laughs> if it's going to be in a more public setting, definitely go with that option. Um, it might cost a little bit more. Um, you're going to have a better performance um, out of the actual event. You're not going to have people waiting on a challenge to, to load or you're not going to have timeout issues. Um, that was one, like, I would say noob thing that I ran into. Um, one of the first times I ever ran a CTF was I needed a bigger server. So <laughs> um, definitely put that into perspective. Yeah, uh, so the, the last thing I wanna make sure that I hit is, is that um, events like this are really good for engaging with the community. And as, as someone who um, spends most of my day thinking about how to train people and less of my time thinking about technical solutions to problems than I used to. Um, and especially as I move more into kind of management level things, directing these projects instead of getting to develop the challenges, that's really important for me. Um, both to understand where we are in the community, but also to understand like how far behind I am so that I can catch up. And that's really important to me. Um, but then also, you know, building better challenges, building better community in general is also really important. So um, I actually jumped at the chance we had a much more active part this year in um, kind of troubleshooting challenges as they went and interacting with the competitors than we did last year. And I jumped at the chance to do that so that I could be interacting with, with all these folks. Um, so that's that's really big. And, you know, I try to continue to do that after the events end, which is why I was so excited when you reached out, uh, you know, to kind of having this conversation is amazing and being able to have conversations like this in Slack as they continue to, to kind of ping me or in Discord, in the Grim Discord um, is really great. So I really hope that that continues both as, a, as an outcome of this CTF and all CTFs kind of as we go forward, because ultimately, you know, competitions should be bringing us together rather than apart. And it's a really good way to do that by kind of pulling the, the community together. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. That That's a, that's a great way to end it. So <laughs> well, hey, both of you did a absolutely superb job. The The game was fantastic. I'm really looking forward towards next year's. And I mean, uh, I, I have nothing but but great things to say. And this has been a fantastic conversation. I hope there's been a lot of awesome insight for others that are, that are listening in and wanting to learn from it. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I can't say it enough. This, was, this has been fantastic. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody has any questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out to myself. Um, I'm sure Tillery feels the same. So, yeah. Absolutely, yep. Lots of ways to get a hold of me. So, fantastic. And uh, a shout out and a special thank you to all the people that did compete because you know putting all the hours into developing yeah. challenges is nothing if we don't have people actually solving them. Yeah. So um, I've been really really happy with the the number of people that have not only tried and and learned something from this but continue to engage with it and with with the other people that are still solving. I think that putting the challenges back up in training mode, you know, in training mode is one of the best choices that Army Cyber Institute could have made because now, you know, that that conversation that's happening is to keep happening. So thank you to everybody that's been participating. And thank you, John, for having us on. With